This is five on your side at six, focused on you. Tonight, striking auto workers in Wentzville are one step closer to a new contract. Thank you for joining us. I'm Ann Allred. This afternoon, the UAW announced GM has agreed to include workers at its battery plants in the national contract, something the company previously said could not be done because of ties to Asia. Five on your side, Tracy Hinson is live in Wentzville with more on what this means for union auto workers. Tracy. Okay, and so agreeing to have electric vehicle battery plant workers under the UAW umbrella provides a layer of job security for members while the transition from gas to electric vehicles happens. Now, so far, only GM has agreed to this concession from the union. We expect it to win at Ford and Stellantis as well. Putting EV jobs on the national UAW contract is a big deal for members. The plan was to draw down engine and transmission plants and permanently re replace them with low wage battery jobs. The EV concession by GM could signal a future deal for striking workers in Wentzville. We're fighting for a fair agreement for all of us um, to be able to get back to work. I know the company wants us back to work to build their products and my membership is ready to go back to work. GM avoided a major strike expansion by working with the UAW on EV plants. We were about to shut down GM's largest money maker in Arlington, Texas. Instead, the union stood down and did not strike any more plants. A first since the strike started three weeks ago. We're still going to hold the line, you know, continue to fight this fight that we need to be in to, to gain a good contract, to gain a fair contract. As the days get shorter and colder, the strike is starting to wear on members. It's, it's come and go. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, really wanting to get back to work, uh, but we understand that, you know, the, that the fight has to go on. The support from fellow unions and politicians has boosted morale at a time when members need it most. To have the uh, the visit of the, uh, the president and congresswomen coming in to uh, basically support you, I mean, it's never been done before. That's absolutely a positive. Now, other UAW members I spoke with said it's the support this year that is really keeping them going, and it's support that they didn't see quite like this in 2019. In Wentzville, I'm Tracy Henson, Five on Your Side. Vice President Kamala Harris rallied Democrats in downtown St. Louis tonight. She spoke to the Democratic National Committee's Women's Caucus at the Marriott Hotel. Our political editor, Mark Maxwell, is live there. Mark. And Vice President Kamala Harris brushed off pundits and poll numbers that show or suggest the president's support is slipping. Instead, she predicted victory at the ballot box next year, banking on voters to reward Democrats for capping the cost of insulin for seniors, uh, alleviating student loan debt for many young people and for sparking new job growth in the manufacturing sector along the lines of electric vehicles and clean energy production. But the vice president also drew a sharp contrast between the two major parties, casting the GOP as cruel and chaotic. The VP seemed to relish in the dysfunction among House Republicans who deposed their speaker last week, and she slammed red state Republicans like those here in Missouri for banning abortion with no exceptions for rape or incest. Since the Dobbs decision came down, every day in our country, people are silently suffering. That's right. So on this point about no exception, this means the policy proposal is essentially that after someone has survived a crime of violence to their body, a violation to their body, Spirit. That they cannot have the authority to make a decision about what happens to their body next. That's right. That is immoral. That's wrong. It is immoral. Say it. Many Missouri Democrats in the room here today, especially those running for a U.S. Senate seat or running for governor, are hoping they can ride the tailwinds of the vice president's visit and of that abortion message to victory in 2024. Uh, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer also here at the DNC this week. The next time we see all these people, this many Democrats in the same room, will be at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago next summer, where the party will officially nominate its candidate for president. And despite those slipping poll numbers, everybody here today expressed confidence that person would be the incumbent Joe Biden. Reporting live downtown, Mark Maxwell, five on your side. More trouble at the abandoned Railway Exchange Building in downtown St. Louis. Firefighters were called there about three hours ago after someone spotted a fire outside of the building. Crews quickly put it out. Firefighters had to check the entire building, though, after noticing smoke coming from one of the upper floors. The condition of the 100-year-old building, more than 100 years old, 
it's made this job very dangerous. Uh, there are a lot of open shafts, uh, a lot of holes in the floors, a lot of voids. So from a firefighting perspective, that's particularly challenging for us. No word on what caused the fire. The Railway Exchange Building used to be the center of downtown. It was built in 1914, and it was home to Famous Bar's flagship store. The city condemned it in January and boarded it up. The building is owned by a Florida company. Attempts to sell it have been unsuccessful. A new piece of legislation in St. Louis proposes to protect the homeless. Just this morning, Alderman introduced Board Bill 126. Our Justina Cornell was at the meeting and joins us in studio with the latest. Justina. Yeah, and so this proposed bill includes the unhoused bill of rights. Alderwoman Alicia Sanye believes this is necessary. Now, it was first announced earlier this, same, this week, the very same night some conflict and tension happened outside of City Hall. Monday night, city leaders said they would remove the homeless camp, but advocates intervened and delayed it until the next day so people could get into shelters during daytime hours. Board Bill 126 aims to prevent something like this from happening. Now it has six components, including the idea of a safe camping zone. Also, if these areas have more than 10 people, the bill requests a porta potty, hand washing station, an outreach coordinator, and even security. When I met with unhoused members, when I talked to advocates, you know, a lot of them were like, well, okay, there's no public bathrooms. Um, if I needed to use the restroom, where can I go? After every sporting event, after Mardi Gras, Right, we see people engaging in public urination, but the the um, the enforcing those laws against that segment of the population is not the same as the enforcement we see against our unhoused population. Now, this bill has been referred to a committee. It was assigned to the Housing, Urban Development, and Zoning Committee. An investigation is underway into what caused the death of an inmate at the Lincoln County Jail. Corrections officers found a 27-year-old man unresponsive in his cell yesterday. Staff tried to save him, but he later died, and his name is not being released. Ten inmates have died in the past two years while in the custody of St. Louis Division of Corrections. Now the mayor says she's creating a new department to improve medical care there. Our Christine Byers explains what it will cost and why other leaders are supporting the plan. They're calling it a chief medical officer, and they're going to have a 10-person staff reporting to them. I think this is a, a move in the right direction. Board of Alderman President Megan Green was one of three city leaders who voted in favor of the $2 million plan. I think um, what, what we are learning from um, the deaths at CJC and, and some of the autopsies that are starting to become available that we need greater attention on the medical system at that facility. One of those autopsies was for 32-year-old Carlton Bernard. He died August 20th. The St. Louis Medical Examiner told me this week that Bernard died from a specific type of dehydration caused by diabetes, not the type of dehydration caused by being deprived of water. She said there was no history of him ever being diagnosed with the disease in the medical records that she reviewed. Until now, a private contractor has handled the jail's medical care, but that contractor has declared bankruptcy and the city is suing it. How exactly the new chief medical officer division will differ from the private contractor remains unclear. I think we're going to have to wait and see. Um, obviously, we had another death um, just about a week ago, and um, and we I, I think that there is appetite for fast change to happen at the CJC, um, and this is a really good step in that that direction. Christine Byers, five on your side. Right now, there is no timeline for how long the city will take to hire this new chief medical officer and staff. Meanwhile, a new private health care provider is expected to start in December.